Welcome back to the 30th online episode of Peacetime. Hosted every Sunday morning by PeacePoint with myself, Pratt Nicholas Tanis Rowe, live streaming from Dhammakaya International Meditation Center in Azusa, California. Today's session will be about an hour and 10 minutes long and will consist of a 25 minute talk and 20 minutes of meditation, finishing up with 25 minutes of conclusion and news updates. Last time you saw me, we looked at doing good deeds that it does you good. With the Dhamma talk today, we will continue with our exploration of living Buddhism with the topic of avoiding unwholesomeness. As usual, this session, in case anyone out there is actually listening, I would encourage you to send in any questions you have by emailing me at peacetime.questions at gmail.com so that I can have a shot at answering them next time round. In the previous session, we examined wholesome karma or merit and how Buddhists typically accrue this. This session explores the flip side of the karmic coin by describing the theory and practice of Buddhist avoidance or mitigation of negative karma. I should start by pointing out that following Buddhist custom in English, in this session, I have replaced the moralist terms bad, evil, wrong, sinful, and immoral with the noun unwholesomeness or the adjective unskillful wherever possible. I will start with a brief comparison of the Buddhist system of morality compared with Western moral systems, which you can also read up on from Peter Harvey's 2000 book, An Introduction to Buddhist Ethics, or Kulatisananda Jayatilake's 1972 book, Ethics in Buddhist Perspective. If a system of ethics is going to be better than people's nature or serve to improve it, the question arises where the ethical standards should come from because most theistic religions argue if people are imperfect, then how can the systems of morality they think up help people become perfect? This is probably because they haven't been introduced to the Buddhist idea of bootstrapping. How each religion overcomes human imperfection depends on what that religion takes as its ideal. In Buddhism, guidelines for ethical choices are not attributed to any supernatural source, but they have their origins in a wiser part of ourselves. There are several categories of non-divine justification of ethics familiar to Western philosophy, which fit with Buddhist ethics to differing extents. And today I will touch briefly on egotistical versus altruistic ethics, normative versus meta-ethics, relativistic versus absolutistic ethics, objective versus subjective ethics, teleological versus deontological ethics, consequentialist ethics, thick and thin concepts in ethics, and aritaic ethics, to see where Buddhism fits. The first way of categorizing ethics is egotistical versus altruistic ethics. Egotistic reading of ethics is where only the welfare of the agent of the action is considered. An altruistic reading of ethics is where only the welfare of others is considered. Buddhist ethics ironically concentrates mainly on the egotistical outcomes. For example, murdering others is ironically considered to be bad because it creates harm to the quality of mind of the murderer and leaves them with karma that will curtail the murderer's own life in the future. The second way of categorizing ethics is normative ethics versus meta-ethics. Using the logic of the golden rule, a person should not inflict on others behaviors which they would not want to receive themselves, otherwise known as normative ethics. By contrast, meta-ethics is discussion of what might be meant by unwholesome or unskillful as distinct from what one might want for oneself. Buddhism tends to conform with normative ethics, although clear definitions of what is meant by wholesome and unwholesome are reasoned through in the Buddhist scriptures. 
The third way of categorizing ethics is relativistic versus absolutistic ethics. Relativism holds that what is right or wrong is dependent on the views of a particular society, culture, or time in history. This view also corresponds with situation ethics, which judges an action in accordance with what, in a certain context, is the central value. For example, compassion. To give an example, stealing food from a store would be considered less wrong if the motivation is to save a starving child. Absolutism holds that certain things are always right or wrong, irrespective of the social or cultural differences. Early Buddhism tends to be more absolutist or timeless in its ethics, but situation ethics becomes more prevalent, especially around the principle of ultimate compassion in Mahayana Buddhism. The fourth way of categorizing ethics is objective versus subjective ethics. Subjectivism holds that what is right or wrong is purely a matter of personal opinion. Objectivism holds that things can be factually right or wrong, irrespective of the observer. Buddhism is a generally objective as it relies mostly on consequences, but this stance becomes blurred when the actor has become enlightened and can technically do no further wrong, as we shall see in the category of transcendental avoidance a little later in this session. A fifth way of categorizing ethics is teleological versus deontological ethics. Teleological theories judge an action by whether it facilitates a valued goal. For example, purification of the mind. Deontological theories judge an action as individually right or wrong to distinguish whether it is one's duty to do or avoid that action. Deontological ethics is mostly Kantian. Rather than talking about duties, Buddhist ethics generally tends to be more teleological in nature, with nirvana or enlightenment as its valued goal. Although, saying this, I have come across good behaviors in the scriptures being described as should be done or garaniyakit cha in some places. The sixth way of categorizing ethics is consequentialist ethics. Consequentialist ethics tend to judge an action by its outcomes, for example, whether it ultimately leads to greater happiness or to greater pain. This approach tends to fit well with the Buddhist logic of karma. The seventh way of categorizing ethics is by thick and thin concepts in ethics. According to Bernard Williams in his 2011 book, Ethics and the Limits of Philosophy, thin readings of ethics talk of general and abstract values as either good, right, or one's duty, and are insubstantial because they fail to flesh out substantial reasons for a person to act ethically. By contrast, thick readings of ethics talk of specific content of behaviors such as betrayal, promise, brutality, courage, cowardice, theft, loyalty, dishonesty, or gratitude. It is more substantial than thin concepts in ethics because it is world-guided and action-guiding. Buddhism tends to favor thick concepts in ethics. The final way of categorizing ethics is Aratheic ethics. Some systems of morality offered by non-Buddhist world religions seem to have less to say when it comes to encouraging people to do good than they do about avoiding unwholesomeness. Buddhism, however, seems to place more emphasis on developing virtues to reach the upper echelons of enlightenment rather than on the unwholesomeness that holds Buddhists back from this. Since in Buddhism the emphasis seems to be on virtues cultivated, it is with good reason that Buddhism is said to be an example of Aratheic ethics. In fact, in a 2007 chapter called Buddhist Reductionism and the Structure of Buddhist Ethics by the philosopher Mark Sideritz, he concluded that Buddhist ethics can most accurately be described as Aratheic consequentialism. 
In Buddhism, moral guidelines belong to two levels. The level of artificial morality, where punishment is based on man-made conventions, elaborated as new problems occur in society, chiefly law and legislation, and the level of natural morality, where the retribution is allowed to take its own course. This artificial slash natural dichotomy in morality will be familiar to you if you've read David Hume's uh, Treatise of Human Nature. Artificial morality is meant to be a mechanism for elevating the level of humanity in society so that the maximum number of people can establish themselves in the practice of wholesome deeds and avoid unwholesomeness. It is otherwise known as the ethics of obligation. Although this should form a lesser part of Buddhist morality, nonetheless, ethics of obligation is made use of by Buddhists. Indeed, According to the rationale of the great abbot of Wapagnam, force needs to be applied to improve people's virtues. The mind is like water, which tends to sink to its own depth. Without effort, the mind's virtue, like water, will fall to the lowest level. That is, the performance of unwholesome deeds. If normal people are to develop their minds to the level of the arahant, then efforts need to be made. The mind has to be brought under control until it comes to a standstill. Thus, to govern others, there needs to be rules. There needs to be something to force people to become better, and there need to be penalties for breaking the rules. From a Buddhist viewpoint, the best policy for unwholesomeness on all levels is that prevention is better than cure. In this respect, Buddhist temples have a key role to play in exemplifying and setting the high moral standard because temples are the only sort of establishment to deal with the root causes of unwholesomeness. Other institutions, whether it be hospitals, universities, and prisons, deal only with the symptoms of the problem. The problem when unwholesomeness cannot be prevented is that whatever legal proceedings are set in motion, all the costs are paid by the taxpayer. The government has to channel untold amounts of the taxpayer's money into dealing with criminality, instead of being able to use its revenues to develop the quality of life and the prosperity of the citizens. Meanwhile, society continues to experience increasingly high rates of criminality that is to say, people who have lost their integrity and their scruples. Ironically, the widely held consensus in democratic countries is that the only way social problems can be solved is to wait until people's behavior turns criminal before allocating funds, manpower, and infrastructure to try and punish them. Thus, Buddhists regard prevention as a better and cheaper approach, but where prevention fails and people do break the law, punishments need to be meted out, but should aim to ensure offenders develop shame of recidivism. For as long as they are unable to teach themselves, then they have to remain behind bars. Thus, imprisonment is not motivated by revenge, but it is more an expression of the public responsibility to protect itself from wrongdoers and to provide the opportunity to reform those unable to return to the right side of the law. Thus, for uh, as far as artificial morality goes, Buddhism favors restorative rather than punitive justice with punishment that is compassionate, bolstering conscience and only isolating offenders unable to cooperate in this. According to Buddhists, knowledge of natural morality is passed down from primordial times, when people were wiser, more insightful, and of higher conscience than people in the present day. In other words, the era I described three sessions ago at the beginning of the Aganya Sutra. Natural morality, unlike artificial morality, is where the retribution takes its own course by the dynamics of karma I described to you a couple of sessions ago. 
This approach is otherwise known as virtue ethics and aligns with the Aristotelian approach to Western ethics. According to natural morality, it is not a question of good and evil, but rather a question of whether, if an action is likely to cause the agent pain or suffering in the future, it is worth avoiding from the outset. It is like a vain person who insists on wearing a pair of shoes two sizes too small for them. The payoff for such vanity might be pain, suffering and blisters in the near future, and on that basis to insist on wearing the shoes would make no sense. Such a pragmatist approach means that there is no need to resort to words like wrong, bad, sinful or evil, because it's just downright dumb if you know the negative long-term consequences it will bring back to you. The thrust of the moral choice is pragmatic, and this is also the characteristic of natural morality in Buddhism, designed to help Buddhists predict the likely outcomes of their actions, so that they can avoid the unwholesome ones that are likely to cause them pain and suffering in the future. Many of the dynamics of unwholesomeness or papa in the say are the same as for merit that we saw in the last session, but they work in reverse. Unwholesomeness is the residue of bad karma incurred by intentional but unskillful actions of body, speech, and mind. Where merit could be understood as a food for the mind, unwholesomeness acts like a poison. Buddhists see the struggle between good and bad to be like a subconscious battle for control in the mind between the powers of merit and the powers of unwholesomeness. For as long as this battle continues, Buddhists need to avoid unwholesome behavior. Unwholesomeness is defined in Buddhism as originating from intentions of greed, hatred or delusion, with the effect of darkening the mind, leading to regret at a later time and undermining long-term benefit to oneself others or society at large. Unwholesomeness has all the opposite characteristics to merit in that it will cloud the mind, worsen the quality of the mind, it can be accumulated, it belongs to the person who did its originating unwholesome deed, and as it is expiated, it will be exhausted. The seriousness of negative actions will be magnified in proportion to the amount of effort strength of intention and ingratitude invested in the action. If a Buddhist wants to avoid picking up negative karma, ideally they should aim to abstain completely from accumulating any more unwholesomeness. As in verse 124 of the Dhammapada, the Buddha says, never does evil befall one who does not do it. Thus, before going into the practicality of avoiding unwholesome ethical choices, it is useful to understand the ideal of a mind free of unwholesomeness. The Tenfold Path of Wholesomeness or Kusala Gamapatha outlines a set of ten ideals to be aimed for. The last three items on the list are actually qualities of mind. These ten ideals comprise absolute avoidance of killing, stealing, committing adultery, telling lies, engaging in malicious gossip, speaking harshly, chattering idly, intending to take the possessions of others, vengeful intentions, and wrong view. Since such ideals are hard to achieve, especially when most of us do not even know our own minds well enough to keep up with the defilements of greed, vengeance, or false views. Others have the intention to say things without upsetting anyone, but when they come to speak, the wrong words slip out. Others want to give up their obsession with the neighbor's wife, but they are unable to get her off their mind. Thus, a more pragmatic strategy is needed to put these ideals into practice, especially to train our intentions to become more wholesome. Avoiding unwholesomeness needs a strategy, just as a person who wants to give up smoking has to start with the intention to give up smoking first. The intention to avoid unwholesomeness is called virati 
in the Pali language or Veramani, which I'm sure you'll recognize from the Pali formula for requesting the precepts because it means the word abstain in English. In fact, there are three ways in which people avail themselves of the intention to abstain from unwholesomeness, situational avoidance, planned avoidance, and transcendental avoidance. And I'll go into detail of each one of these in turn. The first strategy for avoidance is known as situational avoidance or sampata virati. Situational avoidance means avoidance of unwholesomeness on a situational basis. There is no public declaration that a person will avoid unwholesomeness in advance. They decide what they're going to do on the spur of the moment when confronted by the situation. If they see a fish washed up on the beach and they decide on the spur of the moment to throw it back into the water out of compassion rather than kill it, this would be considered situational avoidance. Similarly, it might mean the finder turning in a lost wallet with all its money instead of keeping it for themselves for fear of being accused of stealing. Such avoidance of unwholesomeness occurs as a result of the important ability to act on one's conscience, known literally in Buddhism as shame towards doing unwholesomeness and fear of receiving the consequences of unwholesomeness together known technically as hiri otapa. In this connection, the Majjhima Nikaya commentary called the Bapancha Sutani tells us a rabbit story about situational avoidance. Some people, simply by the fact they have a good or an accurate conscience, avoid certain behaviors which may coincide with the precepts. In ancient Sri Lanka, there was a family where the mother was seriously sick and bedridden. In the family, there were two sons. The younger son was called Chakana. The mother's doctor prescribed fresh rabbit meat as maybe helping her to overcome the skin disease from which she was dying. Chakana's big brother sent him out into the field to catch a rabbit and he did as he was told. Now a rabbit had run into a field to eat corn, but in its eagerness, it had got stuck in a snare and cried out in distress. Chakana followed the sound and thought, this rabbit will make a fine medicine for my mother. But when he saw the little beady eyes of the rabbit blinking at him, suddenly it occurred to him, this can't be right. I can't be sure that if we sacrifice the life of this poor rabbit, that the mother will actually get better as a result. It is not suitable for me that in order to preserve my mother's life, I should deprive another sentient being of life. So he let the rabbit go with the words, run off, play with the other rabbits in the wood, eat grass and drink water. Then he made the wish through the power of my compassion on this occasion, may my mother be cured. When he returned empty handed to the house, he told his brother the whole story and his brother scolded him. But when they looked at the mother's wounds and it turned out that she had got better as a result of the act of truth which Chakana had made, uh, then uh, the older brother soon got over his anger. So this is the example of a person managing to lead a life of integrity, even without taking the precepts in advance. The second strategy for avoidance is known as planned avoidance or samatana virati. Planned avoidance means avoidance of unwholesomeness by formally requesting to receive the precepts from a monk. Alternatively, some Buddhists simply make a vow to keep the precepts each day in front of the shrine. Even if someone were to give a Buddhist a bottle of beer, they would turn it down, not out of shame or fear of the consequences of bad karma, but because they had taken the five precepts that day and fear of going back on their word. In this connection, the Papancha Sutani tells another story, this time the story of a python. Once upon a time, there was a farmer who lived near a mountain in Sri Lanka called 
antara vatamana. One exceptional morning, the farmer had met up with an elder monk called Pingala Pudarakita. Since the farmer knew that this monk was very eminent, he asked the monk to give him the five precepts. Later, after the monk had gone on his way, he met his, made his way back to plow his fields. Unfortunately, he found out that his ox had run away. So he went off to search for the ox, and in doing so, he climbed up a mountain where a huge python took hold of him and wrapped itself around his body. And you all know what pythons do to people. Normally, if you are out in the wild, the way to protect yourself when a python wraps itself around you is to take a hunting knife and turn its blade outwards while holding it right up against your body. So that the harder the python wraps itself around you, the deeper the knife will cut into it and eventually it will give up. That's the theory anyway. So when this happened to the farmer, his first reaction was to go for his hunting knife. He also thought of cutting off the snake's head with his knife. But later, it occurred to him, just now I received the five precepts from that eminent monk. It's not every day I get the chance to receive the precepts in such a way. If I harm the python, then I will be breaking the precepts. If I were to die today, but my precepts were intact, then surely I would have a better afterlife destination than if I were to live a long life but have precepts which are broken. So thinking that, he replaced his knife in its sheath and prepared to die. But the strange thing was that the more the python wrapped itself around him, the hotter it became. And eventually it felt so hot that it left the farmer completely alone and slithered off over the mountain. So this is an example of being protected by the precepts. But in this case, the reason why the farmer trusted in his precepts was because he had taken them in an official way from the monk earlier that day. So now that we have looked at situational and planned avoidance of unwholesomeness, before we go further to look at transcendental avoidance, let's take the opportunity to settle ourselves for 20 minutes of meditation. If you would like to find a comfortable sitting position for yourself now as you listen to my guidance. So if you'd like to start by finding a comfortable position for yourself in meditation. In a position of poise by which you feel you could sit for a long, long time without having to move around too much. Your hands resting, palm upwards on your lap, so that you have a fairly upright posture. And close your eyes very gently, in much the same way you might close your eyes to go to sleep. Start by taking a few deep breaths to yourself, breathing in to the full extent of your lungs, before breathing slowly and smoothly out again. Once again you can breathe in the cool refreshing air from around you. And as you breathe out, you may feel that you're letting go of any worries and concerns at the same time. From there, we take a few moments to make sure all the muscles of our body are properly relaxed. Starting at the top of our head, and working our way gradually down, relaxing all the muscles as we go. So 
So we start by relaxing our eyebrows and our eyelids. Once again, making sure our eyes are only very gently closed. Closed in much the same way we might close them to go to sleep. As for the muscles of our face, we allow them to become soft. Perhaps smiling slightly to ourselves. But taking care that our jaw is relaxed and that we're not clenching our teeth together. From there we relax the muscles of our neck. If our shoulders are tense, we allow them to drop to their natural height. Before relaxing our arms, forearms, hands and fingers. So that as our hands rest in our lap, they seem to do so only very lightly. From there we relax all the muscles of our torso, our chest, trunk and abdomen. Relaxing both of our legs, all the way down to our feet and our toes. So that eventually all the way from the top of our head, right the way down to the tips of our toes. There'd be no remaining part of our body with any sort of stress or tension anymore. If we do notice any tension remaining, we do our best to relax it as far as possible. to leave us with the sensation that the whole of our body seems to melt away into the atmosphere around us, leaving no sense of discomfort in our body anymore, so that we can turn our attention inwards, inwards to the sensation of warmth, well-being, and spaciousness on the inside. Something which by any other name we could call our state of mind. And it's also something that needs to be relaxed further to pave the way for the meditation ahead. The usual way that we relax our state of mind is by letting go of all the normal things that we tend to worry about in our lives. Whether it be thoughts of work, friends, family or studies, we put these things on one side, at least for the time that we're meditating together. If you do have particular things which seem rather important to think about, put them on one side for now, with the thought that you can always come back to them later. Also, we let go of our regrets about the past and our plans about the future.
and where that leaves us is in the present moment with the task in hand which is a space in our lives that we have created for ourselves only by taking a great deal of trouble it's not very often that we get to recharge the batteries of our mind it's only in such a place together with a meditation group that we can really focus on making sure our mind is properly relaxed. So we try to make the most of this opportunity. Bringing our mind back from a thousand different things in the outside world to a single place of stillness on the inside. It's almost as if on the inside there is a sense of peace. Somewhere at the center of our being. Which was probably there all along. But which up till now we failed to notice. But as we bring our mind back from the outer distractions we engage with this inner feeling more and more to a point where the whole sense of peace on the inside seems to pervade the whole of our being to the point where there's no space left in our mind for any other sort of thought. When we feel relaxed and refreshed, both in body and in mind, very gently using no effort at all we imagine that the inside of our body is just an empty space a hollow cavity without any organs or tissues muscles or bones or as if the whole of our body had been transformed somehow into a sort of transparent bubble with nothing on the inside. And inside this empty space of our body, again very gently, without rushing the process at all, we remember back to that picture of the bright shining sun from a few moments ago maybe yellow or red in color orange or white but this time instead of appearing in the sky the bright sun appears within the space of our body shining with a cool, clear light. A light which is soft, perhaps similar to that of the full moon rather than the sun itself. In the beginning, the actual picture may not be very clear to us, But we accept it anyway, even if it's rather vague. Holding that image in our mind as continuously as we can, for as long as we can. Trying to avoid letting the mind spin off onto any other distractions. 
If, however, we do notice that the mind has become distracted, perhaps by external noise, as soon as we realize, we simply bring it gently back again to the center of the body as before. If the inner object disappears, we can always think of a new one. And apart from that, we just maintain the object as continuously as we can, for as long as we can. The other possible problem that may come up in the meditation is an excess of thought. For many people, the stream of thoughts in the mind is almost continuous. And it's hard to find a single break in the th thoughts to give ourselves that sense of peace and quiet. In such a case, to open up a space between the thoughts in the mind, we make use of something called a mantra, which is basically a word that we repeat to ourselves silently, as if we hear the sound of it coming up from the center of our right object. The traditional mantra for this meditation method is the words Sama Arahang Sama Arahang Sama Arahang and we hear the sound of those words coming up as if like a silent music from the center of ourselves from the center of the bright object over and over again, gently encouraging the mind to become free of thought, while at the same time linking our awareness more closely with this point in the center of the body. It's also worth mentioning that we need to be as gentle as possible with the mind as we are meditating. Any trace of force, any temptation to rush should be put on one side. And something which is not helpful for our meditation progress. What we need to use in the meditation is a sense of lightness, a sense of openness, and allowing things to happen on their own, rather than feeling that we have to create experiences in the mind. So now for a few more moments in silence we cultivate our attention at the center of the body, keeping it on target with our bright object at our center, silently repeating to ourselves <clears throat> the sound of the mantra Samma Arahang as well, for as long as there are remaining thoughts in the mind. So now each to their own practice in the silence for a few more moments now until we come to the appropriate time.
gently, gently, continuously emanating from the center of your body, keeping your mind on target, remaining with the inner image, which is the focus for your mind. Your attention wanders off to the things around you. You simply bring it back again to that central point each time you realize. If the inner image disappears, you can think of a new one. But if the inner object changes, there's no need to change it back again to what it was before. Simply follow it in its new form, observing from your center, lightly, gently, and continuously. We continue in this way for a few more moments in silence until we come to the appropriate time. สัพพุทธานุปาเวนะสัพพธรรมานุปาเวนะสัพพสังขานุปาเวนะสัทธาโสทีพระวันทุเทสวัสดีค่ะทุกคนสวัสดีค่ะทุกคนสวัสดีค่ะทุกคนสวัสดีค่ะทุกคนสวัสดีค If you feel at all uncomfortable, then slowly try changing to a more comfortable position and gently finish your practice. So, having looked at situational and planned avoidance of unwholesomeness before our meditation, we turn now to look at a third strategy for avoidance, <coughs> known as transcendental avoidance or samucheta virati. Transcendental avoidance is absolute avoidance of unwholesomeness of the type achieved by those who have attained the stages of Buddhist sainthood. In other words, those who have attained the paths or fruits of Nirvana, and which include the level of stream enterer or sotapanna, the level of once returner or sakatagami, the level of non-returner or anagami, and the level of the enlightened one or arahant. Their consciousness is on such a high level that even the temptation to slip into unwholesomeness doesn't enter the mind, let alone the outcomes of unwholesomeness in their mind, such as speech or action. There's also a story about transcendental avoidance from the Dhammapada commentary. And it is the story of the wife of a hunter called Kukutamita. In fact, it's a love story. Once upon a time, there was a certain daughter of a wealthy merchant who had practiced meditation with the Buddha until she had managed to attain enlightenment at the level of stream entry, which is the first stage of Buddhist sainthood. A stage where certain forms of defilements have been uprooted completely from the mind, while other defilements, such as sense desire, still remain. So, a person who is a stream enterer 
wouldn't have any ill will or erroneous self-view anymore, but they would still have sense desire since desire hasn't been up completely uprooted. Because the merchant's daughter was leading a closeted lifestyle, supposedly in a seven-story tower, one day she saw Kukutamita, the hunter, walking down the street. In fact, Kukutamita, despite his lowly status, was a really handsome guy. She learned from her servant that Kukutamita would be in town only for a single night and would continue his journey the next day. It was love at first sight. The merchant's daughter thought to herself, I will elope with this man, and she married him, turning her back on her life of luxury and going off to live in a forest cabin. She went on to have seven sons with Kukutamita, and while her husband continued with his usual profession, which was hunting and trapping. Each day before her husband went to work, she would be the one to lay out all the knives, bows, arrows, and traps ready for her husband to go off to work. Kukutamita would capture a whole bunch of animals and bring them home or sell them. So Kukutamita's wife didn't personally kill any of the animals, but she laid out all the weapons for her husband to go hunting. One day, as the Buddha was meditating early in the morning, he saw that he could be of great service to the hunter's family. So the Buddha went to the forest where he knew he would meet up with the hunter. That day, Kukutamita was very irritated because he couldn't manage to capture any animals in his traps like he normally could. When he found out the reason was that this monk seemed to be warning off the animals, he immediately put an arrow in his bow and aimed it at the Buddha, who was sitting peacefully under a tree meditating. However, Kukutamita became rooted to the ground. Just as hard as he might try, he could not move from the spot and he could not release the arrow. He was stuck there. Eventually, all his seven sons came out and they tried to target the Buddha with their arrows as well. They too couldn't manage to shoot the Buddha, and they couldn't manage to move either. Eventually, when none of them came home for dinner, then the woman folk came out looking for them, and when Kukutamita's wife saw her husband and sons attempting to shoot the Buddha, she exclaimed the cryptic phrase, leave my father alone, which means that the Buddha was her Dharma father, the one who had brought her to her level of enlightenment. It was only when the males in the family realized that this monk was no threat to them and the Buddha was able to preach to them, bringing all assembled to some level of enlightenment. Later, the monks in the temple were discussing the events and they asked the Buddha how it could be that this woman, who had reached stream entry, shamelessly laid out the weapons for this hunter to go and kill animals every day. The Buddha explained that because this woman had a mind which was so pure, no negative emotions or intentions could arise in her mind anymore. Even though according to her wifely duties, she laid out the weapons on the table, there was no unwholesome intention in her mind. She just did it, like a person with no wound on their hand handling poison can do so without sustaining harm. This is why we call it transcendental avoidance. For a normal person to put out weapons on the table, there must be something which crosses their mind, which is to do with killing. But in her case, there wasn't. Operationalizing planned avoidance usually means keeping the five precepts. And in attempt to make such guidelines easy to understand, they were always enumerated as rules of training or sikapata, which by which the effort is regarded as a work in progress where you are constantly improving on yourself rather than the commandments intended to produce guilt about sin or attract punishment. The Buddha was not even the originator of the five precepts because they are thought to predate Buddhism like a defining blueprint for humanity itself. Five precepts comprise not killing even animals, not stealing, not committing adultery, not telling lies, and not knowingly drinking alcohol or taking intoxicants. 
The five precepts are a set of rules that helps Buddhists to avoid the unwholesomeness of exploiting weakness in themselves or others, and thereby evading the associated suffering and pain that would come back as a karmic boomerang. There are some later Buddhist traditions that elaborate the precepts into ideals, but this form of moral escalation actually makes keeping the precepts more ambiguous. In early Buddhism, ideals were kept separate from precepts to help Buddhists train themselves to actually keep the precepts in a way that they can be confident about the integrity of their self-discipline. To this end, each precept was defined in terms of the components necessary to cause the precept to be broken. To take the first precept of not killing as an example, there are five components. Firstly, the victim must start out alive. Secondly, the perpetrator must be aware the victim is alive. Thirdly, the perpetrator must have the intention to kill the victim. Fourthly, the perpetrator must exert effort toward killing the victim. Fifth and lastly, the victim must die as intended. With the other four of the five precepts, the components for each precept reflect the investment of intention, effort, fulfillment, and awareness of what is happening. Of course, the operant action for each precept will differ. Removing an object from its owner's possession for the second precept, sexual intercourse with someone else's partner for the third precept, misrepresentation of the truth for the fourth precept, and consumption of an intoxicating drink, non-medicinal drug, or tobacco product for the fifth precept. For all of these precept components, if in any situation not all components have been breached, although the behavior may incur bad karma, the precept is still regarded as not having been broken. This is not to say that unwholesomeness does not arise in the mind in proportion to the number of components breached. The idea of keeping precepts is that eventually they become internalized or second nature in a way that makes them transferable even to situations not explicitly mentioned in the precepts themselves, especially the perfection of self-discipline to be seen in a future session. The precepts thus become a force to bind people together in society with trust and integrity. If a Buddhist has intended to keep the five precepts but fails to do so, they simply renew their precepts by saying the Pali formula, Bana, Tipata, Veramani, and so on, to themselves or repeat it after a monk, next time trying harder to keep their precepts intact until they can eventually succeed. Beyond the five precepts, there are several other elaborations of self-discipline that have more ambitious objectives, namely eight precepts, the 10 precepts of novice monastics, the precepts of fully ordained monastics, and the bodhisattva precepts. To elaborate first of all on the eight precepts, these are a set of rules of training which expand on the five precepts with adjustment of the third and fifth precepts and addition of the sixth, seventh, and eighth. The precepts themselves consist of eight rules of training. Firstly, not to kill living beings. Secondly, not to steal. Thirdly, not to be uncelibate. Fourthly, not to tell lies. Fifthly, not to drink alcohol or consume intoxicants. Sixthly, not to take meals between midday and dawn. Seventh, not to indulge in romantic entertainment or immodesty. Eighth and last, not to be indulgent in one's sleeping habits. The eight precepts are intended to be kept by Buddhist householders during times of intensified training, especially on meditation retreats or for self-purification on a periodic basis, such as once or twice a week. Eight precepts are sometimes called Ubo Sota Sila. The only real difference between eight precepts and Ubo Sota Sila is the length of time a Buddhist is expected to keep them. The content is the same, but usually for Upasata Sila, 
a Buddhist will only keep them on the quarter moon days, with the possibility of one day before for preparation and one day after for debriefing. For eight precepts, the length of time is flexible. Next, let's elaborate on the 10 precepts of novice monastics. The 10 precepts are a set of rules of training which expand on the eight precepts with splitting of the seventh precept and addition of the 10th. The precepts themselves consist of 10 rules of training. Firstly, not to kill living beings. Secondly, not to steal. Thirdly, not to be uncelibate. Fourthly, not to tell lies. Fifthly, not to drink alcohol or consume intoxicants. Sixthly, not to take meals between midday and dawn. Seventh, not to indulge in romantic entertainment. Eighth, not to indulge in immodesty. Ninth, not to be indulgent in one's sleeping habits. Tenth, and last, not to handle gold or silver. These precepts are intended to be kept by Buddhist novices throughout their period of ordination. Next, let's briefly describe the precepts of fully ordained monastics. Fully ordained monastics have special discipline in keeping with their aim to become enlightened within the shortest possible time. For the monastic community, eradication of defilements in the mind is intensive, so the self-discipline of monks is exhaustive, dealing with every aspect of their lives. The 227 precepts are a set of rules of training which expand on the 10 precepts. They are intended to be kept by fully ordained Buddhist monks throughout their period of ordination. Many of the additional precepts are intended to ensure monks help maintain harmony and the good reputation of the Buddhist monastic community in the eyes of the lay supporters. It should be noted that the number 227 is taken from the Theravadin Code of Monastic Conduct, whereas the number may be 253 for the Mula Sarvastivada Code of Monastic Conduct for Vajrayana monks, or 250 for the Dhammaguptaka Code of Conduct for Mahayana Buddhist monks. When the monastic code is applied to nuns, the Theravada Code requires 311 precepts and the Mula Sarvastivada requires 364 rules. Finally, let's describe the Bodhisattva precepts. In Mahayana traditions, the quality of Buddhist aspiration has superseded legalistic adherence to precepts as the main priority of practice. So precepts are interpreted in spirit rather than literally. Instead of striving for personal liberation from the cycle of existence by attaining nirvana, Mahayana monks aspire to help all living beings enter nirvana first before they enter nirvana themselves. Monks and lay people alike in the Mahayana adopt an additional 58 bodhisattva precepts from the Chinese version of the Brahmajala Sutta that requires such things as vegetarianism, preaching, care for the sick, and exhorting others to give up immoral behavior in addition to their regular precepts. We turn now to examine how Buddhist avoidance of unwholesomeness affects Buddhist social ethics. Buddhism may have lagged behind modernity in its social ethics. Nonetheless, several of the ethical prescriptions extend beyond individual consequences to address the implied equality of fellow members of society in terms of social vices and ways of earning a living considered ethical. There are six vices known collectively as roads to ruin or abhayamukha. Firstly, drinking alcohol or taking intoxicating drunks. Secondly, nightlife such as frequenting brothels. Thirdly, frequenting shows that have content that is romantic or frivolous. Fourthly, gambling and lotteries. Fifthly, associating with unwholesome companions. Sixthly and lastly, being too lazy to work. These might be considered as socially rooted vices rather than individual vices. For example, prostitution forces there to be financial exploitation in society. 
so the roots, roads to ruin might be seen as a rudimentary form of Buddhist social ethics. Also, from the point of view of ethical income, there are five particular sorts of trade or wanicca that are labeled in Buddhism as wrong livelihood, although there may be may, many more that would be considered gray areas. Firstly, trade in weapons. Secondly, trade in slaves. Thirdly, trade in flesh, that is selling animals to the slaughterhouse. Fourthly, trade in liquor or narcotics. And fifth and last, trade in poisons. So, to draw together some reflections on the Buddhist approach to avoiding unwholesomeness, let me highlight just three issues. How Buddhists are supposed to deal with unwholesomeness they have already done, the ethical status of vegetarianism and skillful means. So let's start with the Buddhist explanation which are concerning what we can do to remedy unwholesomeness we have already stored up from our past. This session has dealt chiefly with unwholesomeness that Buddhists are trying to avoid in the present lifetime. In Buddhism, there is no means of absolution or resetting past unwholesomeness to zero as might be found in Christian faith traditions. Thus, Buddhists go through life without knowing how much unexpiated bad karma lurks in their past. Of course, terminating karma, such as breaking free from the cycle of existence, holds out some hope to escape bad karma in one's past, but this is seen as a fairly exceptional circumstance. In the meantime, for those who are not yet on the brink of enlightenment, the Lonapala Sutta of the Anguttara Nikaya outlines the principle of dilution of bad deeds as a recommended way of dealing with past unwholesomeness. In the same way that a grain of salt, a metaphor here for the unwholesome karma in one's past, may still give a salty taste if dissolved in a cup, or to extend the metaphor of clarity, a bucket of pure water, water being a metaphor for newly accomplished good deeds, the salty taste will still be detectable. It will become undetectable though if the crystal is put in a very large amount of water such as the river Ganges, although the salt is technically still present. In the same way, if a person has so many good deeds in their present that the unwholesomeness in their past is insignificant by comparison, the good karma in the foreground will always tend to give its fruition first. Thus, the Buddhist prerogative is to turn over a new leaf, not to dwell on one's past, and to make sure one's present is filled with habitual positive deeds that are likely always to give their fruits higher up the order of karmic precedence that we saw two sessions ago. A second issue I'd like to mention is the ethical confusion surrounding vegetarianism and free will. In Buddhism, intention is the decisive component of ethical choices rather than circumstances. Intention is always the prime mover. This point is not so easy to understand that even Buddhists get mixed up quite often between intentions and outcomes. A classic case of confusion is the morality of eating meat. Some who misunderstand karma say that to eat meat is as bad as killing animals. And indeed, in later Buddhist traditions, such as the Yogacara, which in chapter 16 of the Lankavatara Sutra, written between the 5th and 7th centuries, have entered this conclusion into scripture. Vegetarian Buddhists say that choosing to eat meat creates market forces, which cause people to take employment in slaughterhouses and hence to kill for a living. However, to follow the logic of karma, which places intention and not circumstances on the dividing line between wholesomeness and unwholesomeness, in theory, every person has the choice about the work they choose to do. It is expected that those who choose to work in a slaughterhouse for a living, even if it happened that one day everybody in the world decided to eat nothing but vegetables, would find other ways to vent their intention to kill. Ironically, it is also to be remembered that even growing vegetables to feed vegetarians involves the killing of some pests and vermin. Nonetheless, most Mahayana Buddhists 
and that means Buddhists who are neither Theravadins or Vajrayanists follow the vegetarianism as it is stipulated in the Bodhisattva precepts. Lastly, let me touch on the subject of skillful means or upaya in later forms of Buddhism because of interpreting precepts in spirit rather than literally, there has evolved the belief that in certain cases, rather than deontological ethicality, the end may justify the means. In early Buddhism, this principle is illustrated in the Majjhima Nikaya's Alagada Upama Sutta of a raft, which points out that a raft is only useful for crossing over a river, but it loses its value once one reaches the other side. The term skillful means has also been applied to early, in early Buddhism to unorthodox means that ultimately lead to a person's enlightenment, such as the Buddha's intervention in the enlightenment of Nanta Thera by promising access to heavenly nymphs more beautiful than his fiancée. In Mahayana Buddhism, though, the same principle may give a flexibility that allows Buddhists to break their precepts if there is a more compassionate ethical choice. So, this session has dealt with how Buddhists avoid unwholesomeness. In the next session, we will explore an overview of the practice of meditation, the means by which Buddhists aim directly to purify the mind. Before today, let me finish up with a quick mention about temple support and a news update about the availability of meditation teaching in English. For those of you who like to visit the temple in Azusa to bring offerings, please be informed that we are still using the site for temple offering in the parking lot next to the main temple building between 10 and 11 a.m. each day. If you have trouble with the passcode on the gate or wish to visit at a different time, please call Jenny on 562-716-2961. There will be at least one monk on standby in PPE to receive the offering and give a short blessing for visitors. English-speaking monks will be on duty on Wednesdays and Saturdays. A short ceremony for five precepts, meditation and a blessing are given on the weekends, starting at 10.45 a.m. Needless to say, the whole temple would like to rejoice in the merit of all continuing to take the opportunity to support the temple in this way. Meditation continues to be a valuable way of tackling lockdown fatigue. And in this respect, here at the temple, although there are still no face-to-face -face teaching sessions for the interim, you can continue to access Dhamma teachings in English at the YouTube channel called Peace Point Meditation or the Facebook page of Peace Point Meditation. For aficionados of Zoom meetings, another way you can access Peace Point content is to join a Zoom meeting ID 970-1192-2337, and the meeting passcode is 072. For those of you who have been following my talks, you may be interested to subscribe to a YouTube channel which I've set up in my own name, which can be found by searching for Pratt Nicholas Tanisro on YouTube and where I'm constantly adding new and archived content. According to the current Peace Point schedule, every Sunday morning you have got me with live material and archived material on alternating Sundays. Venerable Sopon now appears every Thursday evening. Meanwhile, Peace Breaks from Peace Point are broadcast every Tuesday and Wednesday between 7 and 7.30 p.m. There is also a silent meditation broadcast each Friday between 7 and 8 p.m. For the benefit of families listening in, there's a special show for children in English known as Shining Stars that goes out between 6 and 6.30 p.m. every Monday evening with bedtime stories and meditation short enough to keep the attention of younger listeners. Outside of the live streams and on demand programming, you can also download the MindGem app for free, allowing you to listen to meditation and Dhamma talks in English on your cell phone, even when you are offline. So this session, we have looked at the topic of avoiding unwholesomeness. 
for my next live session online with you, which will, fingers crossed, be a week on Sunday morning, we'll be moving on to look at something along the lines of purifying the mind. For good measure, I would like to remind viewers, you can email your questions about meditation or what you've heard in the lecture to the email address that you can see spelled out in the slide, and I will do my best to answer those questions on my next session. In the meantime, try to stay healthy, avoid a recklessness or complacency in the face of the virus, maintain a positive mood, speak only positive words, forgive others, extend good wishes to others, and meditate daily. And hopefully, as a result of today's session, you will now be able to have a clear understanding of how to avoid unwholesomeness of body, speech, or mind in your life. So today, this is me, Pratt Nicholas Tainisaro, signing off for this session. So long, folks, and stay safe.